Hello everyone, so my name is Karen Costello. I'm an architectural historian, so kind of a weird situation here. Um, uh, and I'm a researcher and an invited professor here at, at Coimbra. Uh, so my, my presentation is titled Subjectivity Policies, Comparing Housing After 1945 in Portugal and the US. And as Raquel said, I'm going to have to leave a little bit earlier, uh, so I want to excuse myself for that, but I have uh, parental responsibilities that I can't ex escape, really. Um, and so this is a presentation uh, that's, you know, is related to some of the statements that our keynote speakers made in the morning, so it's uh, also about understanding kind of the the genealogy of the housing landscape that we have today in Portugal, vis-à-vis uh, -vis a certain literature that exists in housing studies that talks about, for example, a kind of a cultural predisposition towards home ownership in Southern Europe. Uh, so there's a lot of synchronic research about housing that actually disregards, uh, you know, as James was, was conveying to us this normal this morning, the very political nature of the history of housing policies. Uh, now these are, you know, essentially political decisions that have, you know, long-term effects. Uh, another issue that I wanted to address with this, uh, what's going to be a paper, is that very often we tend to compare uh, Portuguese housing policies with other European countries. But in reality, I personally believe that it's quite enlightening to compare it, you know, across the Atlantic with policies in the U.S. and Brazil, with which, in certain senses, Portugal has a lot of similarities, way more than with a lot of the more central European countries. Uh, so, um, there are several sections. I'm going to just first talk about USA after 1945 and then Portugal um, and then um, present some points for a conclusion. Uh, so first of all, uh, you know, the paper is going to discuss housing, this politics and circulation. So it's this idea that I already mentioned that we need to acknowledge, you know, the political histories of housing to understand the landscape that we have today. And now ideas and policies and, you know, capital circulates between countries and different re relations, uh, regions of the world, and as it circulates, it shapes, you know, these housing landscapes. Uh, so I'm going to talk uh, about the USA after 1945 and then argue that there's a lot of similarities in, in, in the history of housing policies in Portugal and, and the political intentions. So the USA after 1945 is mostly characterized by, you know, a, a plural kinds of suburbanization and, you know, outside the US and a lot of investment in self-help, uh, including in countries like Taiwan. Um, and that uh, after, you know, very, very quickly in the US what you get is what can be characterized as a dual regime of housing. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that. Uh, so just some background. So this, uh, this, the, this is a system, the, this dual regime is something that emerges with the Great Depression. So the National Housing Act in 1944 creates the Federal Housing Administration, the FHA, which invents the long-term mortgage. And it's something that is very natural for us today in the long-term housing mortgages, but they didn't exist before, and also federal insurance for these mortgages. So a state guarantee that even if people default on their mortgages, you know, whoever is investing is not going to, to lose everything. Uh, so in 1937, the Wagner Act creates the other side of this bureau regime, which is a directly assisted inferior level of housing. Uh, so it, it provides the legal framework for, for public housing, but at the same time it impedes public support for co-ops and other forms of non-market housing. So you have this dual regime in which you have you know, public funding for, for mortgages and then public housing for the poorest. 
and other kinds of, of options like co-ops, which in the early 20th century there was a lot of experimentation in the US around it, and other forms of non-market housing. This really gets, you know, it doesn't mean it can't exist, but the state, the federal state, isn't supporting it. Uh, so, um, from 34 to 1972, the, the effect of this, of this, the combined effect of these policies is that home owning households rise from 44% to 72%. So, this is quite dramatic. And uh, I mean, the main reason is because of these policies for, you know, more privileged people, buying becomes more affordable than renting. So it's it's a rational economic option for households, especially, of course, white households. So the the kind of the canonical image that we have of this post-war suburbization are suburbs like Levittown which uh, were built in, in various places. Uh, we can see an image in Pennsylvania, another one from Long Island. You know, but actually, what is often disregarded is that th this suburbs kind of replaced a much more plural landscape of housing. And for example, Paul Grove, who was a geographer, uh, wrote about the role of residential hotels in the US uh, until 1945, so a lot of people were living in hotels, both billionaires and homeless people. Uh, so these are plans of different kinds of hotels for people with different uh, levels of income. And so this was really an option for a lot of people until the 1940s, and then they start gradually disappearing due to these, due to these federal policies. Um, one thing that is also disregarded when we focus on suburbs like Levittown, you know, these ones that we see in the TV shows that we consume from the US, is that there, there were other kinds of suburbs. There were a lot of self-built working class suburbs in the US. Uh, some of them have been researched by scholars like South Gate in Los Angeles or West Oakland, which are very different kinds of suburbs, much more similar uh, to uh, informal subdivisions, for example, in Southern Europe or in South America. And uh, in terms of the colonial spaces of the US and also later uh, in, in development spaces, uh, the kind of strategies that were used were different. It was more about aided self-help. This is an image from an, ex an early experiment in Puerto Rico, which is a US colony in the 1940s. And then after the war, you know, Nancy Clock wrote a, a great book called World of Homeowners about how this was exported uh, to other countries, you know, as part of anti-communism in the Cold War um, by, by the US. And we can see an image uh, which is in, in Taiwan, actually. But there were also programs, you know, financed by, by the US and in Brazil and other countries. Uh, so there's this dual housing regime in which you have a lot of investment in housing mortgages for white privileged suburbs and then uh, public housing, usually for black people and for the poor. And this is a legacy with which the US still, still lives today and of course there's also trailer parks and all of that. And there's no time in this presentation to address that. So Portugal after 1945. What you get in Portugal is also suburbanization, but mostly what we call in Portugal clandestine suburbanization, so forms of informal subdivision, and also um, a lot of investment in, in forms of self-building in, in colonial spaces. And by the late 1960s, also the Housing Development Fund is created and establishes a similar dual regime. Uh, so in 1933, the Constitution, uh, you know, defends that the state should foster the constitution of independent homes, and this idea of a property and citizenship is diffused uh, during the Salazar dictatorship, you know, and this idea of home owning household as the fundamental unit of the state by very well known people like Salazar or architect Rolino or you know, other people, other kinds of experts that have been forgotten today. 
But while this is a fundamental political idea of the solidarity dictatorship, at the same time, housing is not seen uh, as part of development planning in the post-war years. So it's not seen as an investment that the state should do. So what happens, and I've argued this in uh, earlier work, is that there is a tolerance of informal subdivision from the 1950s onwards as a way of you know, the state not investing anything in suburbanization, but at the same time reaching its political aims of people being homeowners uh, and having you know, uh, nuclear family units living, living in, in detached houses. Uh, so this is an example of an, uh, two aerial photographs of an informal subdivision near Lisbon. And you can see you know, the explosive growth between the mid-1960s and, and the 1970s. You know, this is an image in the 1980s of these kinds of neighbors. Now they look completely normal. Like back then, they didn't have uh, a lot of Republican infrastructure. Uh, of course, there's other kinds of suburbanization going on, you know, railroad suburbs, uh, automobile suburbs, and, and there, these are some advertisements from the 60s and 70s. And in, in, in the occupied territories uh, in Africa, you, you get, you know, similar solutions to the ones that the U.S. had uh, diffused earlier in the post-war years, which is forms of aided self-building. Uh, to house, you know, in this case, Mozambicans in, in the suburbs of Maputo, then Warren Smart. And also a more violent process, which is the, the villainization program in, in the rural areas during the wartime years, for which more or less two million peasants were forcibly rehoused in Angola, Guinea, and Mozambique. Um, so what happens by the late 60s is that due to Portugal joining the European Free Trade Area and the huge rise in FDI, you know, there is a shift uh, in, in economic development policies. The Housing Development Fund is, is created and housing is now framed as a, as a social right. And the Housing Development Fund, similar to what had happened in the US, has a dual function. Uh, so direct promotion. Uh, for rent to buy units and um, and public credit and it's also a public credit entity to st stimulate private industry uh, and so in 1976 there is the uh, you start having publicly funded mortgages this lasts until 2002 and that's where most of public investment in Portugal goes is to fund people buying uh, houses you know, having done loans with banks. You know, much more money for that than, you know, public housing, which was similar to the states not seen, you know, unlike the UK or Germany and other countries where housing was, you know, public housing was quite massive and also aimed at the middle classes. In Portugal, it was really aimed, like in the US, for the poorest strata of the citizenry. Uh, and, you know, similar to the U.S., there's a huge rise in homeowning households from 49% in 1970 to 73% in 2011. So it's a very similar numbers, a little bit later than the U.S. And even the OCD in a report in the early 2000s warned that the program was actually doing a kind of, you know, inverse redistribution. You know, it was shifting tax money to you know, the construction industry and more privileged people instead of, uh, you know, helping the poorest. Uh, so I'm just going to conclude, you know, at the same time, there's this, uh, you know, rented rooms gradual becomes something where, you know, a lot, a quarter of the population of Lisbon lived in rented rooms in the 70s, you know, and this becomes increasingly in the more privileged press is something that's seen as almost evil and you know unhealthy, and it, uh, renting became something you know, uh, you know seen by the most privileged as socially unacceptable. Uh, so in the paper, I also talk about later um, developments like these forms of exceptional planning from the from the 1970s and 1980s onwards, in which 
you know, public money is used for private profit, you know, removing huge chunks of urban territory from the democratic process, and Idalina Batista has written a lot about that, so you can check her publications. So I, I'm just going to conclude. Uh, so this is not an argument about delays, I'm not arguing that, you know, Portugal is an underdeveloped country and this happened first in the US and then because we're underdeveloped it happened, you know, 30 years later in Portugal, so I'm not interested in those kinds of arguments. Uh, I'm interested in the need to explore in the domain of housing this transatlantic circulation of ideas, techniques and capitals, and I, I mean circulation, not a kind of unidirectional flux, because decisions in the US also depend you know, on, their pers on perspectives on the rest of the world. Um, I also think there is a need to explore the plural landscape of housing in the US, given the importance you know, of virtual US spaces in the imagination of the future in Europe and other regions of the world. And I think this, all this can be help to better understand the contingent formation of housing policies in Portugal, including in the more recent period on which Raquel's project um, focuses. And finally, I'd just like to say that, you know, political projects from the past, like what I call property citizen, of course create path dependence because we inherit this housing landscape but I mean this was a very long-term project very ambitious if we think about it when people in the 1930s were imagining that you know everyone would would be homeowners so that they wouldn't be communists you know this was incredibly ambitious and you know, a very long-term project so I mean today we can also try to think about similar long-term projects, you know, what, what kind of future do we desire now and that's adequate for a, a political democracy, regardless of whether it's more liberal, whether it has a, a model that's more hybrid and gains inspiration from experiments like Singapore. And, you know, this is a very urgent debate and I, I really think it's great that Raquel is leading this project because this is a, a moment of housing crisis but also of how climate crisis and you know housing and housing construction and the way you know housing is planned in the territory is of huge importance if we are going to face the climate crisis. So this is something that we have to have in mind too when we think about the future. Thank you.